Kiora Tatu Katoa Ko Mark Griffiths Toku Ngoa No Paraparaumu Au Kai Manatu Aho Matua O E Mahiana He Scientist Matua Au Ko Kapiti Toku Motu Ko Otaki Toku Awa Ko Derek Griffiths Toku Matua Ko Sybil Griffiths Toku Fire Norera Tenakotu Tenakotu Tenatatu Katoa So the title of my presentation today is Monitoring and Assessment of North Island Tuna. Um, but in order to understand how NPR goes about the task of monitoring and assessing tuna, it's um, important to know some details about their life cycle. And I know many of you know all the details that you need to know, but some of you might not. And just in the interest of getting us all on the same page, I'm just going to whiz through the, um, through the life cycle of the two species. So as most of you know, we actually have three species of freshwater eel in New Zealand. You have longfin tuna, shortfin tuna, and Australian longfin tuna. But we don't get many Australian longfin tuna, so we're mostly concerned with just the longfin and the short fins. Um, both species spawn at sea. The eggs develop into what we call leptocephalus larvae. As they approach the coast, they turn into what we call glass seals, which are just little transparent eels. They then move into rivers. Within a couple of weeks, they take on some color. We call it pigmentation, and they become elvers. Now, you've heard a bit of talk about elvers today. Um, the elvers in the rivers grow into what I call sub-adult eels because they're not, you know, some people call them adults, but they're not really mature. Um, the sub-adult eels then mature, they become silver, their gonads develop, they go back out to sea to spawn. Just a little bit about maturity. Um, tuna, as most of you know, they are semiparous, they, they, which means that they just spawn once and then they die. Um, mature tuna have developed gonads and they're silvery with large eyes. Um, the important point is that they mature at a relatively large age, and um, average, the average age at maturity for longfin female is 40 years old. They can mature as much as 100, 110 years old. Average age of maturity for shortfin females is 25 years. As we heard earlier too, um, when they mature, the mature, the mature eels or tuna migrate downstream in autumn. Um, they then migrate north to a spawning ground, which we believe to be somewhere in the Fiji Basin, and they spawn and then they die. Um, the eggs and larvae travel southwards on, uh, using a combination of passive transport and also prevailing ocean, oceanographic currents. Um, when the leptocephaly larvae approach the coast, they transform into glass seals, as I mentioned earlier, and they enter the rivers in, in around about spring. Um, glass seals are typically 9 to 12 months old and about 6 to 7 centimetres long when they, come, when they enter the rivers. Um, they, as I mentioned earlier too, they become pigmented, turning into, into um, elvers within a week or two of entering the fresh water. Moving on to elvers. Um, Elvers are generally pigmented tuna that are less than 15 centimeters long, and um, at this size, they're actually capable of climbing up um, vertical surfaces using surface tension. Larger than that, they, they, they're not so good at doing that anymore, so that's why we use 15 centimeters as a cutoff. Um, they spend most of their time, the elvers, buried in the substrate or the gravel, and this can be down to depths of about 50 centimeters. Um, for a period of about two or three months each year in late summer, they migrate upstream. So they only migrate for two to three months of the year. The rest of the time they spend under the gravel. And it's during this time when they accumulate um, at dam walls, which is important for the trap and transfer and also for the monitoring that we do. Um, and the further from the sea um, a particular dam system is, the older the, older the elvers are generally. Um, but in some rivers, they just tend to migrate more quickly than others. So the, the, 
Moving on to the sub subadults, which is the next phase in the life cycle. Um, the subadults are tuna that are larger than 15 centimeters, but not yet mature, so they, they're not breeders. Um, they're sometimes referred to as yellow eels or in other parts of the world, but it's not really an accurate description, I don't think. Um, the important part here is that the commercial fishery targets um, subadult tuna of about 300 grams to 4 kilograms or 300 grams to 2 kilograms in the Waikato, because there's a, a smaller maximum legal size at the moment. Um, one point to note is that um, even though the maximum legal, the, the minimum legal size rather is 220 grams, um, recently legislated escape tubes of 31 centimeters diameter um, generally exclude um, tuna smaller than 300 grams. Commercial fishers voluntarily avoid migrating tuna, which is an important point when we come on to monitoring later. So getting on to some of the monitoring, um, just, to, just first up, just to mention that um, MPR basically sets commercial TACs for each QMA. Um, we, uh, the South Island QMAs have recently been changed from ANG to, to SFE and LFE, but um, we're, not, we're going to be focusing on North Island at the moment, so we won't worry about that now. But they're basically eight, they're four, four spatial areas, but eight, um, eight quota management areas, because there's one for each species. So getting on to um, MPR tuna monitoring. Um, the research that MPR conducts to monitor yields is largely divided into, into two types, um, and that is um, recruitment of elvers and um, the relative abundance of exploited tuna. So that's the size that are taken by the commercial fishery. Elver recruitment is monitored by counting the number of elvers arriving at dams throughout the country during the elver migration season in late summer. And um, the abundance of exploitable tuna is monitored using standardized catch rates um, made by commercial fishers using the forms that they submit to, to MPI. So I'll deal with each of those separately. Commercial CPUE, um, so what we do is the catch per day for each commercial fisher is then in, is in modeled um, according to a number of variables. So year is the important one because you want to know how abundance changes from year to year, but we include these other variables so that um, the model can account for changes in catch rate that have got nothing to do with abundance. So, um, and another important point is we, we try and produce a standardized a catch per unit effort or series of relative abundance for each eel statistical area for each species. So we, we, we're not doing it at the level of the QMA, we're doing it at the level of the eel statistical area, which is at a, a, a finer spatial um, resolution, which is often more important for um, local management. Um, North Island ESAs. Um, these are the ESAs, so we try, as I said, we try and produce a CPU series for each of these, um, for each species, sorry. Uh, uh, Eel statistical area, sorry. Um, I'd also like to say just a little bit about the percentage of longfin habitat that is fished commercially. Um, the standardized commercial CPE monitors the abundance of longfish, longfin tuna of um, legal size in the part of each ESA that's, that is fished commercially, which is, which is an important point because not all of the habitat is fished commercially. And um, in 2014, we commissioned a project that was done by NIWA um, to determine the proportion of the habitat in each ESA that was fished commercially or impacted by hydro dams. Um, work was done by NIWA, as I mentioned, but with quite a lot of input from the EEL working group as well. So there was a bit of an iterative, iterative process. Um, the area fished in each ESA was determined from face-to-face -face interviews with fishermen using maps. So we, we, it, seemed, it was done pretty accurately. And um, the, area, the areas that weren't fished included um, Dock Estate, areas closed by MPI to commercial fishing, such as the, the Wanganui, the Motu, and the Mohaka Rivers, and um, 
also inaccessible areas and stream inaccessible areas and also streams that were too small to be um, commercially viable. Um, I won't say too much about that now. But um, this is some of the this, these are the results from that. Um, so we're looking at um, each the ESAs. Um, Codes. So AA is, is, is Northland, basically, and, and sort of moving south, generally speaking. But the, this column shows the current habitat that is the proportion of the current habitat that is fished. And you can see it's pretty small. In some, in, for some um, eel statistical areas or ESAs, it's only 2.4%. For um, the area with the highest proportion fished, it's 50%. Some of the South Island ESAs, it's a lot higher. It's up to, up to 80% down south. But um, in the North Island, um, pretty, pretty low proportions fished. Um, this column, um, the maximum impacted area is the area fished commercially plus the area of habitat lost to um, hydro dams, basically. So it's a totally a, what we're calling a, a, a sort of the total impacted area. One, once again, even when you factor in hydro dams, still only 5 to 55% of the or 56 percent of the habitat is is ultimately um, impacted by fishing or dams. Moving on to the, um, the North Island CPUE trends, um, this is a picture of the ESAs, the map of the ESAs once again, just so you, you can find your particular ESA or area of interest. Um, starting first of all with um, so this. This slide shows the trends in CPUE or relative abundance for short fins in each of those ESAs. And the dotted line shows, um, is, coincides with 2005, which is the year when eels on the North Island were introduced into the quota management system. And at that time, the catches were actually cut quite substantially because we were concerned about sustainability of the stocks. Now, what you'll see from this, I guess the take-home message is that there's been a, a gradual increase, and maybe not so gradual in some areas, but in most ESAs, there's been an increase after eels were um, included in the quota management system. Uh, Sorry? No, no, the cat, the catch is down because the TACs were set to, to limit the catches, to make the catches a lot smaller because we were, we were concerned at the time that, that eels needed, needed some protecting. So. Um, these are the trends for long fins in, in, each, in each ESA. Um, after the introduction to the QMS, long fin biomass has generally remained stable or has increased slightly. Uh, you know, you, you, you get it individual years when something weird happens, but the problem is that after the introduction to the QMS, the catch was reduced to such a level that um, there, were, there were very few fishers remained in the fishery. So you don't have a lot of data, and you can see for a lot of these series, the confidence intervals, these, these vertical bars increase, that means that there's a lot less data, um, so a lot less certainty on the result. Um, mostly, and um, yeah. The, this, the series from the, for the Rangatiki um, Wanganui area ends because the fisherman in the area has had no ace, so he hasn't been able to catch long fins for quite some time. Are those dark Rangatikis particular robust in the area? No, un un unfortunately, the data is the data's collected on statutory forms and it's done by ESA as the, the finest spatial resolution. Um, uh, we are introducing, MPI is introducing a new electronic monitoring system and um, once that's introduced we'll have information at that long level. So, so that's not really accurate? What? You, you, you're right. We, we have got another program where we've looked at um, the catches. It's, it's done voluntarily. Um, the um, LFRs have made data available to us voluntarily at, through NIWA and um, looking at catch by catchment, they catch by catchment is actually pretty consistent. So within each ESA, so the, the main rivers remain the main rivers. It's not as though they're moving around. So.
Oh, you're you, you, you absolutely right. And, and, and in the future, once we get uh, finer spatial uh, scale resolution information, you'll be able to look at catch rates in a particular catchment. But at, at the moment, we're not, we're not able to do that. Um, So, so there are some limitations. Um, just a lot of these trends should actually be increasing more steeply than they are for a number of reasons, which I'm about to get into. Um, one of the, well, the, the, the first and most obvious limitation is that those CPU trends also only apply to areas that are fished commercially. So it's maybe three to fifty percent of the total um, habitat within each in any ESA. Um, but CPUE after 2005 was biased low, so it's been pushed down for, for a number of reasons. Um, there was an increase in the size of escape tubes from 25 to 31 millimeters in 2012-13, which means that some eels that were previously retained are no longer caught, so that's limit, reducing CPUE to some degree. Um, and that, also, that, that one also applies to short fins but the others less so. Um, um, so with the limitation in ACE, introduced first of all by the introduction to the quota management system, eel fishers began returning a lot of their um, longfin catch to the, to, the, to the river, basically, because they never had enough ACE to cover it. They, 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 sh they should have been recording that on um, their statutory forms. Some of them haven't. Many of them have, but they haven't done it correctly. Um, I, it's, it's not that they're to blame, because I probably would have done it the same way that some of them have. <laughs> um, that the forms were quite complicated. So, they, so um, in other words, what's actually happened is their returned eels aren't included in the CPU analysis. So before 2005, they would have been included. After um, 2005, as ACE became limiting, and, and it became even more limiting in recent years because many iwi have been shelving um, longfin ACE because they've been concerned um, with the sustainability of longfin eels. So there's been even less available, which means that the commercial fishers have been returning even more to the water without recording it. Um, so, and then the final factor, which is also which is limiting or, or negatively biasing the CPU trends, is um, the unrecorded release of tuna larger than four kilos or larger than two kilos in the Waikato co-management area. And um, the, the four kilo maximum size limit was introduced in 2007-08, but um, thanks to MPI there, or the Ministry of Fisheries at the time, there was no statutory requirement to record that. So, so prior to that date, 2007-08, the four kilogram eels were all kept and included in the CPU analysis. After that date, they all returned, and they're not, they're not included in the CPU analysis. Um, voluntary logbook programs from the South Island um, show that the commercial fishers are returning thousands of large eels to the water each year, so it's, it's, a, a, it's a significant portion of their catch. It's not being recorded. Um, but once again, a plug for the new system. Um, we, we will be recording the... Um, the, the large eels that are returned to the water um, in the future. We don't know. That's the point. We don't, we don't know how much has been put back. But in the, in the South Island, the local eel fishers introduced a, a, a logbook program that some of, the, some of the fishermen operated. So they recorded all of their, not statutory forms submitted back to NPR, but, but they recorded them on their own forms. <laughs> um, but um, we're at the mercy, all your graphs there, we're at the mercy of their honesty and, and of the stroke of the pen. And if it's really like sea fisheries, uh, well, uh, they're quite catch that they dump, etc., etc. It's never ever logged or registered. So um, I'm not saying it's a flawed um, graph that you've shown on us, but I, uh, there needs to be some type of yeah, so, and, um, so, so, getting those figures are 
but, but if they recorded their catches, these would go up. So it's not in their best interest not to record it. It's, some of them have recorded, so we know, we know that they do. They're, they're meant to record them as destination code esks, but we've got two forms. They're meant to include them as part of the estimated catch, but a lot of the guys just um, record their retained catch as the estimated catch, and then in the second form, they, they put in the destination, their return deals, but that's not what we do our CPU analysis on. We, we use the data from the first form. So, yeah. It's just unfortunate that they're commercially driven. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are going to be uh, 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 claim shifting driven. Yeah. Yeah, so this is so. So yeah, I'm, this is not about. I'm not trying to defend commercial fishing or in, in any way. All I'm, these are just indices of abundance that we that we use, and I've just, you know, that's how we get to them, basically. Yeah. So. Uh, so so moving from CPUE to the Alba monitoring programs. Um, so the, the the first point to make. You're probably right, but we, with this new electronic monitoring system that will be introduced on the 1st of October, we've got a whole new, it, it's done differently and uh, I, you, you, you won't, you know, it's, it's a lot clearer. I don't think you'll have the same, the same, the same problem. What, what is the weight? It's got to be, um, in, the, in the white cato co-management area, it's got to be below two kilograms. So it's 300 grams to two kilograms. In the um, rest of the country, there would be 300 grams to 3.9 kilograms or, or to four kilograms, you could say. Yeah. So they're returning a lot of fish, in the, we know, in the South Island larger than four, four kilograms or up to 10 kilograms even, you know. Oh, absolutely. They're always still alive. They, they're caught in fight nests, and they, yeah. The only, the only place where they've had issues with uh, eels not being that healthy, with, you know, when, when captured is, is to, to a horror with, with large nets and, and having too many eels coming in, but generally they, they're all pretty good. They only set overnight, and yeah. So for reasons limited, why are the losses taken any time when we're so short of them throughout the country? So, sorry, why are they? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, I, it's, it's, they have to release the big ones because we realise that they, they, they're breeding stock. But, but we, so, so, sorry, what I would like to say is that my role as a scientist is to just examine the science. I, I, I don't really want to get into a, a discussion of management. I, I have a colleague here who I'm sure would like to get into that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, I'll leave the bro alone, you fellas. <laughs> Man, I'll go, would you like to come back to the next Tinder conference? And he'll be, hell no. <laughs> hey, look, uh, look, uh, uh, look, let me tell you, you've stimulated more questions in the first five minutes of your presentation <laughs> than all of the present presenters did in the whole day. Look, what, what we'll do is uh, we will go through, we, we will allow this good man to finish his presentation and then you fellas can get him, all right? Kapoi, so we'll wait for him to finish and then we'll take some questions at the end. Kapoi? I won't run away. Eh? Oh. It's alright, bro. I'll hold the door open for you. You're probably going to have to run away. <laughs> uh, uh, alright, so <clears throat> our main purpose for, for monitoring elvers at dam sites um, is, is to ensure that we, that we have enough adults escaping to, to spawn. Um, and it's, it's not our intention to measure the recruitment into every possible waterway. 
what we're trying to do with this program is to try and get, choose those rivers that will give us an indication of recruitment to the whole country, or, or island specific, to the North Island and to the South Island. So we, we're looking for main sites that are indicator sites. Um, so this slide shows all of the sites where trap and transfers, <coughs> trap and transfers, elva trap and transfers taking place, and um, where we're getting some data, but the ones in medium blue, they were light blue on my computer, but I think that's medium blue, <laughs> um, are sites that we've designated to be main sites, where we, and we put quite a lot of money into maintaining um, standards and ensuring that um, data is collected in a standardized way and that the methods used for collecting the elvers are kept or maintained over time. Piri Para is, is, is here in um, dark blue because it's not one of our main sites, but the guys are doing a wonderful job there and we're getting excellent data. So it's, it's a site that we also look at. I'm going to present some data from the main sites. You will note that I won't include Wairua Falls because it's only been going for six years. They get, they get hardly any long fins, and I could only fit four graphs on a slide. So, <laughs> so in terms of working out recruitment, it's useful to know how old the elves are when they arrive at the respective dam. So you can back calculate to work out how many came into the river in the first place. Um, this is a picture of an a eel oatlet that's been sectioned, and it's a three-year-old um, in Elva. That's the, this first check is the freshwater check, so that's when it came into the, into the river as a glass eel. And it's been in the river for three years. Um, here are the median ages of elvers at the various sites for short fins and long fins. So you'll note that most of the long fins are one year old, except at Piripa where they're two years old, medium. That's the median, so there'll be quite a range, but that's the median age. And um, for short fin eels, they're mostly one year old, but at Patia, they're zero year old. And if you're interested, at Wairua, they're also zero. They just, they've only just come in. So this is some of the so what we've done is taken the numbers recorded for each year, back calculated using the age, and then expressed that um, using a relative index. Because if you use numbers of eels, uh, um, Carapiro is just orders of magnitude more than anywhere else, and it just kind of pushes everything else down so you can't see what's going on. But um, the important thing to notice is th well, there's three, there's three important things, I would say. First of all is that recruitment to these dams is highly variable. Um, but that's not unusual because I work on inshore species and if you look at what happens with snapper, they do something similar. You have really good years followed by several bad years and then really good years. And that's because the environment actually plays a big role in determining um, how many eggs and larvae survive, basically. Um, the other important thing is that you get similar peaks at, um, at, at all of the dams, which tells us that we're measuring a similar thing. Perry power is a little bit different and it, it's... It's a bit of a, recently it's behaving the same way, but this sort of gradually increasing trend is, is something that doesn't look quite right to me, but um, it's, it's something we're still working on. Um, the other, the third important thing is that there aren't really any trends in this data. It's, they're going up and down, but they're fluctuating what we'd say without trend. It's pretty flat. They're not, they're not definitely not going down or disappearing. We're still getting, we're still getting good years. And um, obviously this is, only um, for the last, since 1993, I mean, we, we're not comparing and, you know, we, we can't compare back to what happened in the 70s or the 50s. This is just um, re recent data. This is uh, similar plots for short fin. Um, you'll note the same sort of thing, quite a lot of uh, interannual fluctuation, peaks matching from different dams. Um, you could argue that there was a slight increasing trend at Carapiro and a slightly decreasing trend for Patia, but that just might be localized effects from, you know, nationally, I, I, it doesn't look to me as though there's been any, um, anything alarming. Moving on to the stock assessment for um, North Island tuna. Um, when we do stock assessments, we try and establish what we call reference points. 
So we need to compare the stock against the reference point to work out where, you know, whether it's too low or too high. And there are four types of reference points that we generally use. The first one is a target. Um, and in the case of yields, we've chosen a default target of 40% B0. And what that means is 40% B0 is 40% of the biomass that would have been there if, the, if there was no fishing and no dams, basically. So what we're trying to say is we would like the tuna population to be at 40% of its unfished level. Um, most fish populations are at their most productive when they're down at 40%. When they're up at 100%, the number of fish dying matches the number of fish coming in, so there's no net, there's no net gain. The next reference point is what we call a soft limit, and that's, that's half the target. And the reason we have that is because if a population goes below the soft limit, we, our harvest strategy standard dictates that we need to have a rebuild, a, a, a properly, an official rebuild plan in, in place to, to rebuild that population back to the target. The third reference point is what we call a hard limit, which is half the soft limit, and if a stock goes below the, the hard limit, the idea is that you close the fishery. Yeah. And then the last one is an overfishing threshold, which has got to do with the, the number of fish you take out compared to what's in the water. So it's a, based on mort fishing mortality, and um, it's just the fishing mortality that will give you your 40% B0. So. The, the LFE population in each ESA was assessed by taking into account um, the proportion of habitat that was impacted by hydro dams and commercial fishing, which, as I mentioned, was quite, was quite low in the North Island. The CPUE trend, we also took into account the CPUE trend in the fished area, which, as we saw, was either level or in increasing slightly. We took relative exploitation rate into account in the fished area, which I'll explain briefly. Um, and then also trends in elva recruitment at dams, which you've already seen. So um, this is just to try and explain relative exploitation rate. I'll go quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, this is an example using Northland, um, the Northland ESA an example. This is a CPUE trend. These, the blue line is the catches, and you can see the catches have declined. Um, if you divide the catch by CPUE, so you, you, you take the catch and divide it by your relative abundance, you end up with what we call a relative exploitation rate. So relative exploitation rate, as you can see, has been declining and is well below the average, um, it has been well below the average since about 2005. The, the data in the back end here is, is not that reliable because a lot of the catch was recorded as um, unidentified um, eel. So, Wrapping up, this is a, summer, a table that summarizes the results of our stock assessment. It looks pretty uh, dense and complicated, except that every single ESA's assessment was exactly the same, so we only really need to go through one up at the top. Um, um, this is the maximum impacted area, so only 40% in AA is uh, impacted by dams or commercial fishing. We con NPR concluded that the stock was likely to be which is 60% probability of, uh, above, at or above the target. It was, um, the stock was very unlikely to be below um, the, the soft limit or the hard limit, and overfishing was unlikely to be occurring because of the low relative exploitation rate and the small proportion of the total area that was actually being fished commercially. Moving on to North Island uh, short fins, there were no negative trends in recruitment. Short fin CPE is increasing in most ESAs. Relative exploitation rate is um, below the long-term average in most ESAs. Um, there's no information on the proportion of habitat fished or impacted by dams. And as a result, it wasn't possible for us to come up with conclusions on stock status um, in relation to, to reference points. Um, so I've, I've just reported back on um, our recent review stock assessment, review of the stock status of North Island eels. Um, this will be followed up by a review of TACCs. And there's a, there's a brief um, timeline of that given here. This, that part of the work will be led by my colleague, Duncan Petrie. Duncan, do you want to stand up so people can see who you are? So, 
It's, it's, as you... So, uh, it's, it's not easy to miss. Kia ora. Ko Duncan Petrie toko ingoa. Noor Wellington ao. Kia. Analyst Matua ao. Kia. Oh, sorry. Uh, Ministry of Primary Industries. Uh, I panicked. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll be. So Mark's obviously the scientist, and I'll be running the review of the North Island tuna. So Matua Bill, uh, you raised a question earlier about long fin tuna and why are we harvesting them? You know, within that under four kilogram. Uh, that's the kind of thing that'll be discussed over the coming year between now and we need any decisions implemented in 2018. So my plan will be to go around for the rest of this year, uh, talking to Iwi. Um, I'll, I'll be giving a simplified presentation of Marx, what Marx has presented, because it's pretty hardcore, it's pretty technical. And then um, once I've got uh, Iwi's input, I'll draft up a consultation paper, and the consultation paper will go out in February next year. And that's when that's the official consultation period where people can submit. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Questions. Questions. I, I just can I, can I just um I just like to a few people I'd like to thank before we get onto that. So I, obviously uh, what I presented was an enormous amount of work. I'm not all done by myself. Um, so um, I'd like to thank a whole bunch of guys from Niwa who um, did the work. Um, I'd like to thank the your working group members. Many of them are here today for their contribution to the assessments. I'd like to thank all those iwi that were involved with trap and transfer programs at dams uh, of giving us a lot of this wonderful data. Um, I would also, lastly, a big thank you to, to Waimari for um, the opportunity to speak at this conference. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.